parts of this nation. The jurisdiction is an amalgamation of the laws of all 50 states, therefore the laws of your community may differ. The cases are argued by attorneys and presided over by Judge William Keene, who served on the Superior Court of Los Angeles for 18 years. Six miles, Roger. Very proud of Qantas. On the movies, Easy Rider, they all showed Paul as being a really glamorous thing to, to be involved with. Soon after Steve married Brenda, she fell into his lifestyle, enjoyed it for a time, says it seemed better than her father's alcoholism, which ultimately led to his suicide two years into the couple's marriage. But then, enough was enough. And then to be... Um, a year or so into the marriage and find out that now you're, you're married to a pothead, I was angry. I was very angry at God. I felt deceived, misled. Everything that I did was centered around getting high. If I was going somewhere, I had to get high first. If I was going to a party, I had to get high first before I went to the party to get higher. As we said, enough is enough. Her thoughts turned to having children, but Pot had become the other woman in Steve's life, a factor which figured into a challenge to the marriage when she demanded that he stop or she'd leave. Goodbye. This was not what I'd bargained for when I married him. This was not the Stephen that I had married. And now it was, you know, I was not the most important thing in his life, and I wasn't the girl that he sent cards to and flowers to. And it had no bearing on me. It was there was only one thing that I needed, and that was pot. It may or may not surprise you to know that going to church was in this couple's background. But then that's a fairly common practice for many Americans. But it wasn't until after 10 years of marriage that they had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was after they came to know the Lord, and it happened here at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Oak Hill, that they were set free from their problems, he from his drug addiction. For years, I had smoked every hour of every day, sometimes more often than that. And the day went fine, the following week went fine. It was just, it was overwhelming for me to realize that it was so easy. Were there no more Often than that. And the day went fine, the following week went fine. It was just, it was overwhelming for me to realize that it was so easy. Were there no temptations at all after, subsequent to that experience? Did you have any temptations at all to, to get back into that thing? Not really. I had uh, I'd gave it all to the Lord, and he had taken it away. And about six months after my actual deliverance, I was at work one day, and I heard a song come on the radio, an old song by Jimi Hendrix. Caught off guard in a moment of weakness and overwhelmed by a dark suggestion from the past, there was a momentary and embarrassing fall. But a repulsive taste of the old drug life sent him back to the addict's only lasting hope for freedom. With the help of my wife and my pastor, I was came to realize that Jesus would forgive me if I repented and confessed to my, my brothers and to my father that I had sinned and that I had fallen away, that he would surely forgive me. Once God has chosen you to be his child and you have accepted him, that your sins are forgiven, that when you stumble and you fall, that he is there and he wants to pick you up and to love you if you will just accept that. Bill Freeman for the 700 Club, Oak Hill, West Virginia. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the reality of God on this program, when we talk about the ability of Jesus Christ. Will you be nice to me? On sexual feelings through men. I was a young child. I was also very effeminate. I didn't like to play with guns or boys type of thing. Boys bore me to death. I didn't have to look very far to find where homosexuality was. It was always there. It came to me. I was unhappy. 
the, the gay experiences I was having. I would feel cheap and dirty after. At the time, I was a hairdresser, and I was very successful. All the wealthy doctors' wives, lawyers' wives were in the salon. I couldn't believe how unhappy they were. There they had all the wealth to buy, but they were very unhappy people. The unhappiness that Sam saw in the lives of his clients only magnified his inward struggle, and he began searching for something more. And I remember at this time we had a Bible in our house, and I opened it up, and I opened up to Leviticus. And in Leviticus it says, it's an abundation before God for a man to lie with another man. The Lord was opening my eyes a little wider. And I realized that homosexuality is a lie. I just started crying out for God. And that's when I started practicing my religion. Did everything that I could to try to, you know, get rid of this gayness. And uh, as a result, I was only really depressed in it. I became very religious. I figured the only way to get this evil out of my life was to go into a monastery and live a cloistered life. And I felt that this was the way to holiness and the sanctity. But Sam began to lose hope in ever finding a way out of his lifestyle when all he found at the monastery was another homosexual man. But when Sam was 26, he was invited to a charismatic service where he met Jesus Christ as his personal savior. There was just a peace there. There was a, a, a joy. It was beautiful. It was bigger than life. And I knew I found some kind of an answer. I did accept him then. And things began to change in my life after that. Still struggling with his sexual identity, Sam was delivered from his homosexual desires one night during a healing service. And that was the whole turning point of my life. I just felt washed. I felt clean. Because the first time in my life, I had a joy and I had a happiness. And that's all that really matters. But God hadn't finished yet. Sitting next to <laughs> soon to be his wife. We had no idea that we were going to fall in love with each other. My idea of the Lord and her idea of the Lord were two different, you know, things sometimes. But we still knew his power. I just happened to put my arms around her. And I kissed her. And it was like, it was like dynamite. It was like power that I never even knew existed. And I just fell in love. I realized that she was my source of healing. And she was everything that the Lord placed in my life to be my helpmate. Sam and Nancy were married in September of 1978. And although the past few years have been filled with struggles, God has seen them through each one. Today, Sam is firmly convinced that every homosexual can be set free by the power of Jesus Christ. You know, it was a lie. Satan lies to people and says, you're gay, you're gay, and you're not. God made every male a male and every female a female. And to live totally holy and straight. And my male identity, well, I think with five kids tells us how much we love each other. A dedicated family man, Sam is truly a new creation in Christ. This is not only in life that I need. He's everything that my heart ever desired. And all I know is that I'm living for him, and I love him, and I just can't wait till I see him face to face. And there's nothing, nothing I wouldn't give him. For the 700 Club from Trenton, New Jersey, I'm Caroline Bolique. Thank you, Caroline. Lovely story. Great story. You know, the thing that we're, we're talking about and all the things we've been showing, you know, and if you've been watching the, um, the newscast, uh, I remember yesterday I was on my way home from work and I flipped across the dial. And... All right. Uh, letter number... <laughs> letter number five. <sighs> Dear Dave, I have a mustache that I constantly play with, whether alone or in public. Sometimes, especially during an important meeting, people make fun of me when I run my fingers through it, even though I don't even realize what I'm doing. Have you ever had this problem? Sincerely, Greg Farkas, Columbia, Missouri. Uh, no, Greg, you know, I've never really had this particular problem, but I can sympathize with you because, uh, you know, I myself once had a little, kind of a little unconscious habit that I picked up somewhere along the line, and until it was pointed out to me, I had, uh, I had no idea that I was even doing it. Very strange, but I... So we're going to be running some focus groups out in Little Rock. What we're trying to do is surface some probably minor areas of improvement on the show. We should be able to work up a cluster analysis on the data and get a top line to you by close of business on the 9th. 
As to your request for a private elevator car, we're doing a back-of-the-envelope study of elevator usage in this part of the building to see how we can minimize the disruption to pedestrian traffic flow. It doesn't look like it'll be a problem. Our backup scenario is to divert other employees to use one of the freight elevators. Of course, we'll have to get it inspected and certified for passenger use. Nightlight has more comedy and the get. Wah! Needs a Fleming at Sweetwaters, and on this panel, whenever you're on the block, right? Yeah. Promise? Yes. And as for Craig Jessup and Ruth Hastings, they're all over the country. They are the best of the best. Help me wave bye bye to all of our friends in San Francisco and stuff like that. Stay well. Swing in the alphabet. Swing it the swing 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 right. 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 I'll explain it so even you can understand. My colleagues will assist. Ready, sister? Get that junk out of here. Come on, boys. Scram. I'll give you the idea in a nutshell. B A B B E B B I B E B I B O O. I'll give you the correct demonstration. Judy Pie, pound those horse teeth. B A B B E B B I Bicky by B O Bo Bicky by Bo B U Boo Bicky by Bo Boo. C A J C E C C I Sicky Sai C O So Sicky Sai So C U Su Sicky Sai So Su. Get the idea, girls? Now we'll all join together on the letter D. D A J E E C C I Sicky Sai C O So Sicky Sai So C U Su Sicky Sai So Su. Now live in our New York studio, author, columnist, Nat Hentoff, whose novel, The Day They Came to Arrest the Book, is about a high school controversy sparked by efforts to ban Huckleberry... Excuse me. Let's take for granted, let's accept that arguendo, as the lawyers would say, that Huckleberry Finn is indeed a classic. But let us also accept that it must cause pain to black youngsters who have to read it in junior high school or in high school, especially when they have to read it out loud. Sure, and that's part of the learning process. I've talked to kids and I've watched classes, particularly in a junior high school in Brooklyn over the years, and, and the kids will say, yeah, when I started this, this book, and I, and I see nigger page after page, it was, a, it, was, it was pretty awful. Then they begin to read the book and see what's happening. And what happens to them then is what is called education. What Dr. Wallace does, unwittingly, unintentionally, is to underestimate the intelligence of black kids. I mean, what is learning? To begin with, it's to know language, to control language, to not be afraid of language. If you protect kids by saying, no, no, they can't hear these words like nigger, they go out in the world and it is still mystification. Right, you demystify with, language. Without, without categorizing now, mm -hmm. let us assume that there is another book that really is a piece of racist trash that does use all this language but doesn't have the redeeming value of a, of a Huck Finn. Uh, what then are your reasons for keeping that out of a school? <coughs> I, you it can also be educational, right? 
Well, yeah, but first of all, you can't buy every book. Second of all, there are so many first-class books that never get read, I have no problem saying this thing isn't even worth reading. All right, but if there are so many first-class books that haven't been read, why does one have to read a book like Huck Finn, which uses... <laughs> if you read the novel again and again...